Well, in two weeks, I will be going back to school. After 14 years of not being in school, uh, bring me down just a little bit, Steve. I think we had our VBS uh, voice in there, so <laughs> it was kind of loud. After 14 years of being in school, I've taken a break, but I've decided to go back and work on what's called a doctorate of missional leadership. And what that is, is it's going to... Uh, take our congregation, our, our church, and, and see how that fits in the context of the neighborhood that we're in and, and in the city of Kilgore. And, and hopefully we'll be able to learn from that and, and, and reach folks for the kingdom of God and do good things for the kingdom of God and transform this town to be uh, followers of Jesus Christ. And so that's the plan. But... It's been nice for 14 years not having any stresses of school things, right? I don't know if you remember uh, what it's like to, to think about going back to school. Just me saying that, the, the teenagers and the kids are probably just feeling knots in their stomach because if they were anything like me or if you were anything like me, going to school could be tough. It could be stressful. I remember so many times I was sitting there and I was hoping and wishing for a grade that, that, that was passing, right? Or I was hoping and wishing that I could pass this test. Or I was hoping and wishing and hoping, waiting for the day that the final bell rings where I could sing no more pencils, no more books, no more teachers' dirty looks. School can be tough. And we hope that we pass. We hope what we, we do uh, will get us to where we want to be in life. We use this word, hope. And the way we use this word, hope, is more like wishful thinking than what hope really is. We hope we pass this test. We hope there's money at the end of the month in our bank account. We hope that we aren't too sick. We hope this sermon won't go too long. We have hopes. But these hopes can be wishful thinking. Maybe we'll achieve what we hope. Maybe it won't happen. When we hope, we are hoping for the best possible outcome. In Scripture, we hear about the word hope. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, it says, There is one body. One spirit, just as you were called. One hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We've been talking about the seven ones, the seven essential teachings of the Christian faith. These are teachings that cannot be bent or broken. These are teachings we have to follow. And probably the greatest teaching, the greatest uh, act of our faith is this one hope. The very reason that we are here this morning is because God offers us hope. We have one Lord that we follow. We have one God that is in three persons. We have one faith where we put our faith in Him. We know we will have this hope. We have this body, this church, this one universal church that, that follows Christ and hopefully reminds us of this hope we have. We have this baptism that we're baptized into Christ. Our sins are washed away so that we can be with God and enjoy this hope. We have the Spirit that's given to us at baptism where the Spirit will guide us to transform our life so that we can have this hope. And what is this hope? So often, this hope is for a better life, something different. Our present struggles and the uncertainty of what the future holds creates a constant need for hope. We have poverty and hunger and disasters and terror and violence, and we have this longing for hope. We look into the future often with fear. There's no better time to look into the future with fear than what, is, what we're in an election year, right? 
And it seems like we're always in an election year, almost, because the campaigns don't stop. And one of the greatest campaigns that people do is to instill fear in us. No matter what side, they will say, if the other side gets elected, it's the United States is gone as far as we know it. Fear is powerful. Fear might win elections, but people don't want to live in fear. We want to live in hope. We have a God that's all-powerful, and a God that could rule us by fear, but he chooses not to rule us by fear, but he gives us a choice, and he allows to, and he rules us by hope. And yet, so often we live in fear. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul talks to the Ephesians about what life was like before they knew God. What life was like when they lived in fear. He says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and the foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope, without God in a world. So many in this world are living without hope because they choose to live without God. So they live in this world that seems to be more and more chaotic People are more and more confused about who they are and what's right, what's wrong. Back when I was in school 25 years ago, I was in a, a, a philosophy class. And in this philosophy class, they had all these questions but had no answers. And, and, the, and the philosophy professor would just shrug his hands like, we don't have any of the answers. And I sat there in that class and I said, I do have the answers. The answers aren't hard, but they are if you don't have a God. Because without God, you have no hope. You live in this world where you just struggle. Because you don't know what's right or wrong. And you live in the chaos of this world. But God offers something different. God offers hope. Apart from God, you don't find that hope. No greater uh, a testament to that than would be King Solomon. King Solomon, the wisest person in the world. The, the, the man that had riches. The man that had fame. The man that had everything. Finds that a life without God is a life that's without hope. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 17, it reads, I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also the madness of folly. And I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I started thinking about that. What does that mean? The more knowledge we have, the more grief we have? Certainly that can't be true, but King Solomon, he was wise. And he understood that just knowing things only makes the world harder. In my lifetime, we've, uh, uh, certain things have been invented that, that, that have changed this world as we know it. The internet came on strong when I was a junior and senior in high school and in all of my, my, my college years where we had the world at our fingertips. We could find the answers to anything. And this next genera this generation that, that, that's up and coming right now, they call them Generation Z. The best term I've heard for them is called the digitals. Where it's a generation that was born basically with a cell phone in their hand, a smartphone in their hand. And if you have a question to anything, you have it right at your fingertips. Ultimate knowledge. You want to be anywhere in the world? You can have friends all over the world. You can know what's happening all over the world. You know the news from all over the world because you are omnipresent now. Because we're interconnected and it's in our fingertips. And you would think something like this, this knowledge would be incredible. And it is in some cases. 
But I think it kind of takes us back to the garden when the people wanted to know good and evil and only God would, would, is able to handle that. God gives us this choice and, and then we have evil in our life and we choose to follow after evil. Well, the same thing happens is we wanted to have knowledge, the same knowledge that God has, the omnipresence where we could be anywhere, or the omnipotent knowledge where we know everything. And yet if you look at us as a society, we become more depressed. We're filled with more anxiety. It wasn't too long ago that I was asked to judge a science fair uh, competition. And I don't know why they asked me, but I was a willing participant to go and judge. And, and I went, and it was an eighth grade science fair competition. And I went around to all the booths, and I'm judging them. And what really broke my heart was so many of the projects had to do with anxiety. Kids that were struggling with anxiety and they were looking for different ways. Does different types of music help with your anxiety? Or if you just stared at different types of color, does that soothe your anxiety? And I thought, these are eighth graders. These are kids. Why should they be worried about anxiety of this world? They should be having fun. But these were kids born in the digital age where they know all the problems of the world. It's all at their fingertips. They know all the issues that are happening in this world. And it beats us down. The struggles of this world beat us down if we are a world without hope. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12 says, Hope delayed makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is the tree of life. And so we want something better than what this world offers us. This world offers us pain, this world offers us struggle, but we have a hope for something better. And I believe you can only find that in God. We use the word hope like it's wishful thinking. But hope that's written about in Scripture wasn't used that way. The word in Scripture for hope is el peace. And el peace means a joyful and confident expectation of good. So when the writers of the, of the New Testament, they talk about El Peace, one El Peace, one hope. It's not just wishful thinking that maybe this will happen, maybe there's a better life waiting for us, but it's confident, it's assured. These people aren't thinking, well, possibly God will come. No, they had an assurance of their faith. That it's not, it's not that it might happen, but it will happen. Every morning... In June, July, and August, I have this thing called an echo dot that sits right next to my bed. And every morning it gives me notifications, and, and it gives me notifications from the National Weather Service. And I don't know if you have one of these things, but it will tell me uh, almost every single day in July and August, it will say, the National Weather Service has issued a severe heat warning for today. When I woke up, before I ever got that notification, I knew it was a severe heat warning because I've lived in Texas for 47 years. It would be very odd if it wasn't hot outside. I'm sure these people must not be in Texas and they're just surprised at how hot it gets. But I know this. I know when I wake up in August, it's going to be hot outside in Texas. The sun of Texas has never let me down. I have assurance that it will be hot. And when they give that, that weather uh, attention notification, I know it's going to be true. And just as much as that's true, if not more, it is so true that God offers us relief from this world. Not just relief, but He offers us glory from this world. He offers us a, a, an escape from the struggle of this world. We have so many fears about what this world has for us. The pain and the suffering. And probably no greater fear than the fear of death being separated. And I love that the gospel offers hope. In 
Thessalonica many years ago. Paul is preaching to the Thess- Thessalonians. And he talks about death. But he says those that are in Christ, they shouldn't even worry about death. As a matter of fact, they don't even really die. In Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, We do not want you to be informed, uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest of those who have no hope. Death is scary to us, but it shouldn't be to Christians. What Paul's saying is, there's no death, it's sleep. Several years ago, I was at a funeral and and I had to take Sydney to the funeral with me and she was either three or four years old and I saw this guy across the auditorium where I was and and I needed to talk to him. I hadn't seen him in several years and I'm holding Sydney and the quickest way to get to him we kind of had to walk by the casket. And I think I might have told this story before, but as I'm walking by the casket, Sydney's looking in and thinking, that looks kind of strange. And as I'm talking to this guy, she says to me, what's wrong with that guy? Not the guy I'm talking to, the guy that's laying in the pine box. And I say, shh, not right now. We go back to our seat and there's people around us, but Sydney says, well, that guy looked weird. And so I decide as a good father to be philosophical or theological and i say well that guy was a christian and christians go to sleep and one day that man will wake up he will open his eyes and he will see jesus and sydney looks at me and says that man's dead right (laughs) i said sit not right now we'll talk about this later But what I told Sydney wasn't just a fairy tale. It wasn't just wishful thinking. What I told Sydney was real. The assurance of hope is that we close our eyes and we take a nap, and when we open our eyes, we will see the trumpet sound or hear the trumpet sound of Jesus. We will see him coming for us. It's not wishful thinking, it's true. We get to be with him forever. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. It reads, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will be with the Lord forever. Look at the promise that awaits us. I'm not afraid to take a nap. I enjoy taking a nap. And so we should have no fear what waits for us after this world. We wake up. We hear the trumpet sound of God. We meet God in the air. And how long are we going to be with God? We're going to be with God forever as He prepares this new world for us. As He prepares a world that has no struggle, that has no broken relationships. As He prepares a world where we aren't separated from Him. As He prepares a world that has no violence, but only peace, love, and joy. This is the world God prepares for us. This is the world he wants to bring us into. And for those of us that have given our lives to Christ, for those of us that have been baptized into him, that have received his spirit, that have had our sins washed away, we get that forever. And it's not just maybe we'll get it. It's not wishful thinking that we get it. It's hope. It's assurance. We will get that. That's what he offers us. We don't have to fear what happens in this world because we have something greater. We don't have to fear, well, maybe will we get there? Maybe we won't. Am I good enough? It's not that we are good enough. It's that he was good enough. That he did everything for us. We remove the fear of sin and death. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, It reads, the Spirit 
you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought, you, brought about your adoption into sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Paul wants to remind us that Jesus didn't come to this world just to make us have another fear. Well, are we going to be good enough? He came to this world to remove all the fear. To give us assurance that we will one day be with Him. It's not about how good we are. It's about how good he is. And he wants us to have no fear in that. He wants us to realize that we are his children. He's adopted us into his family. And in his family, we receive all the gifts that are offered through his family. We get to be with him forever. We get to have our sins washed away. We don't have to deal with pain or struggles or, or worry about sickness or how much money we have left in the bank. We have all that wiped away. One of my friends in high school, his father owned an oil company, or I guess he still owns this oil company. And they're a pretty well-to-do family, as you can imagine. And they lived in a very nice neighborhood north of Houston. Well, there's another family that lived down in the, in the inner city, in the projects, I guess you could say. And there was a woman, and she had a terminal disease. She was going to die pretty soon. She had recently come to faith in Jesus Christ, and she attended a church called the Impact Church of Christ down in, in the inner city of Houston. And this is a church that primarily focuses on the homeless and, and those that are very poor in that area. And somehow, these two families, they get connected. And this woman doesn't have long to live, and, 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 and even if she is living for a little while, she's not able to take care of the kids. And so... This rich oil tycoon, he adopts the children, three elementary age student kids. He brings them into his family. He takes them from the projects into the nice neighborhood, North Houston. And I know they all struggled with their mom passing away. Obviously, they, they, they did and they should. But the two boys... They find their life, new life, in the rich neighborhood, in the rich house, pretty nice. It's like something that they could have never experienced, but the girl, she struggled. She never felt like she was part of that family, and, and she would run away, and, and she, she didn't want anything to do with that family. And I don't know the ins and outs of all of her struggles. Obviously, she had a tough life. But she didn't want what was offered to her. And I think about us. And Christ has come to this earth to offer us something great. To offer something that is, is beyond our wildest imagination. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it says, now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. Indeed, we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that God, that will be revealed to us. Now, Jesus didn't just come to this earth and, and come to our little neighborhood and pluck us out of the projects. Jesus came to this world and He lived among us and He suffered the way we suffered. God experienced everything that we experienced. He experienced betrayal. He experienced pain. He experienced separation. He experienced suffering. He experienced life being poor and hungry. He didn't just pluck us out. He was there with us. But He offers us life beyond this suffering. 
When I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do was to ride a bicycle around my neighborhood. And we, we had a great neighborhood in Houston. We were, we were not annexed by the city of Houston, so we, we, uh, we lived in this little, basically a little island in the middle, and we had woods all around us, and we had this, these, what we called the trails. And we would take our bikes down the trails, and, and there was a big drainage ditch. It was just a dirt drainage ditch that would flow all the excess water into the, into the bayou. And we would ride up and down those trails and we would jump ramps on our bikes and we had the best time on our bike. Well, the summer between my third and fourth grade year, I was riding my bicycle and the ball bearings froze up on my bike. And the bike stopped and I kept going. And I landed right on my elbow, shattered it. I had to have surgery on it. I had to have pins in my elbow. I can't even bend my arm all the way. But once I got that cast off, do you think I quit riding that bike? Do you think I ever regretted that I rode the bike? It was one of my favorite things to do. It was worth the suffering that sometimes happens on a bike. I don't know if y'all remember what bikes were like back in the 80s, but they would always, those pedals would hit your shins and give you bloody shins all the time. Or if you ever rode with pants, you'd get caught up in the chain. I don't know. It was, there's a lot of suffering with a bike, but the bike was fun. Can you imagine the, the glory that awaits us? Sure, we have suffering. Sure, we have pain. Sure, we have sorrow. Sure, we have issues with our relationships. But I love what Paul says is, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. In Romans... Chapter 8, verse 28, it says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. <clears throat> for those God foreknew, He predestined to conform to the image of His Son, that they might be the firstborn among the many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He called. Those He called, He justified. Those He justified, He glorified. Now, who was predestined? Anyone in this world that wants to escape this life of suffering and live in a life of hope. Who's been called? Anyone that wants to leave this life of pain and experience a life of joy. Who will be glorified? Anyone that submits their life to Jesus Christ. When we're washed in His blood, our sins are washed away and we are justified before God. We can stand before God and we can leave this life of pain and suffering. And it's not just wishful thinking. It's assured hope. It's going to happen for those that want to give their life to Christ. And if you want to give your life to Christ today, you can. You can be baptized in Him. You can be raised in His resurrection, given the Holy Spirit, which marks you for His present glory. Or if you need the prayers of the church, please come while we stand and sing.